right, I can see we have folks starting to make their way into the seminar room. So welcome and give us just a few minutes to get folks in here and then we will kick things off shortly. So as folks continue making their way into the seminar, we'll give a few more minutes. Um, should see the screen displayed right now, which has information about our seminar series. We are uh, approaching the tail end of the series. We've had a great series of talks so far. Uh, eight uh, to date, we'll be having the ninth today. I just, just wanna let people know that we have added one more talk to the end of the summer lineup on August 26th. Uh, that will be Dr. Manning from Sherlock Biosciences. Uh, we're getting the details of title and description together, so you should see notifications uh, within the week, and we'll get all of this added. Uh, you will be able to register for the talk at the same location on our website for the talk series. A uh, link to that is indicated right here. Uh, you can follow that link. You can also link to that off of the um, Biomaker Space Development webpage that is live. Um, other contacts, in case you have other questions about the space or the group, are available and listed on here. And if you would like to join any of the mailing lists, if you are not on them to date, uh, the announcement list for the space is indicated here, and the group mailing list for the Biomakers group is here. Um, so, uh, I think we are probably getting up to where we have uh, a good number of people in, so we'll, we'll lead off. Uh, just a couple notes today about the way we run the seminars. Uh, as a note, we will have all questions just held to the end, uh, at which point it works best. And I'd, I'd love it if you would uh, use the raise hand icon and it'll bring you off mute to be able to ask the question yourself. And you can have the, the direct conversation and interaction with our speaker that way. And we find that is the, the most engaging and the most uh, effective. Uh, if you have any trouble with that, just reach out to me, let me know and I can help, uh, help enable that. Um, Otherwise, I, I think that is the, the biggest of our notes. So I'd like to hand things over to my colleague, uh, Maxine Jonas, who will introduce our speaker today. Thank you, Justin. Uh, I'm Maxine Jonas, a teaching faculty in biological engineering at MIT who spearheaded the creation and growth of the biomaker space. And I'm really proud of the value that uh, Justin Buck is director now, as well as the Biomaker student group are adding to our summer through this uh, seminar series. Today, I'm extremely delighted to introduce Dr. Patrick Boyle from Ginkgo Bioworks, the organism company. Uh, after earning his bachelor's of science at MIT, Patrick went to Harvard for his PhD uh, and worked with Pam Silver. Uh, before joining uh, Ginkgo over eight years ago, he was one of the very early employees at Ginkgo and saw the company then grow up to 400 people or so nowadays. And I'm sure he'll tell you about the, the growth that is happening this year in particular. Uh, there he continued to work on computational and experimental tools to engineer bacteria and yeast and plant. And as of late, actually, Patrick's even uh, learning uh, the, the lay of the land with mammalian cells uh, through their collaborations with Motif, uh, Ginkgo's prime company, to work with plant-based meats 
uh, and, and other products, high, high value products once again. And more pertinently and more pressingly today, uh, Patrick will tell you about their efforts to tackle the COVID-19 epidemics and all the work they're doing for uh, detection or through vaccination uh, at Ginkgo. I'm sure you will enjoy uh, his talk a lot. Uh, he'll tell you about the uh, incredible ambition and incredible accomplishments that Ginkgo have achieved over the past five months and that have landed them uh, the prize of being one of the seven companies recognized by the NIH to lead the accelerated detection effort for the country. So I'm very much looking forward to Patrick's talk. Uh, don't forget to ask him about some awesome big green egg recipes. Uh, he's a very good smoker and griller. And Patrick, take it away. Thanks, Maxine. Uh, this is the first time that anyone's included my uh, barbecue uh, proclivities in an intro. So yeah, um, I think we should add that moving forward. Um, if anyone wants to talk about barbecue after the talk, we have plenty of time for Q&A. So uh, we can focus on, on that too. Um, yeah, so it's great to be uh, it's great to be uh, back at MIT, even if it's uh, virtual. Um, really hoping that I get a chance to uh, see the makerspace uh, once we have an opportunity. Um, um, again, you know, really want to make sure that I have time for uh, for questions. As uh, uh, what I'd like to do today is, is provide a, a brief intro to uh, to Ginkgo, um, and particularly in terms of the work that we're doing uh, prior to COVID nineteen, and then spend the the bulk of my time actually talking about our um, pivot to provide as much platform capacity as we can to support the broader COVID-19 response. And as I'm sure uh, many of you on the on the call are, are uh, working in similar areas, but would love to share um, ideas and thoughts on how we can leverage bioengineering to uh, make the biggest impact we can on, on this pandemic. Uh, so uh, Ginkgo, as folks may know, um, has its origins at, at MIT. So the, the gentleman on the left uh, here is Tom Knight. Um, he was a, a professor of electrical engineering at MIT for many years. He actually started at MIT as a high school student. Um, and he really cut his teeth uh, at MIT in the electrical engineering department uh, during the early years of the, of the computer revolution. So his master's th thesis, for example, was on uh, uh, PDP computers and, and bitmap displays. Um, so he really s saw the world of computing uh, grow up through the 1960s and 70s and 80s. And you know the, the genesis of Ginkgo um, and, and really one of the, um, uh, the kind of founding story for synthetic biology uh, was uh, really started with Tom and, and a number of other folks around MIT uh, starting to think about uh, what does it look like to uh, to engineer biology the way that we engineer um, other other substrates and and part of the um, inspiration for this was that um, at the time this was in the mid 90s uh, Tom was teaching the semiconductor design course at, at MIT um, and he had challenged his students to think about um, what happens at the end of, of Moore's law so you know in other words as uh, transistors uh, get smaller and smaller, you need uh, more and more speci uh, specialized chemistry and physics uh, to be able to place atoms precisely enough that you can design high-end uh, computer chips. And, and one of the things that he had realized with his students was that in order to get to the ultimate level of precision, atomic scale precision, really the only technology that was able uh, to do that um, uh, reliably was, was biology. So, you know, coming from the perspective of computer science uh, and, and electrical engineering is how Tom came into the world of, of biology. Uh, again, this was the mid nineties. Uh, uh, he ended up taking um, graduate courses in biology at MIT, uh, reaching out to a number of, of engineers and biologists in, in the community. So. Uh, the, the other uh, four founders uh, here at Ginkgo were um, uh, PhD students in his lab uh, in the early 2000s, as well as in the lab of, of Drew Endy. Uh, he worked with other folks. So Pam Silver, uh, my mentor at Harvard, was one of the first biologists to work with them. And, and they really started approaching biology in the mid-90s and early 2000s from the idea of what does it look like to uh, look at biology the way an engineer does? And of course, that's probably not a revolutionary idea to, to this audience, but it certainly was in, in the mid 90s and early 2000s. Um, and Ginkgo, uh, founded in 2008, is really the realization of that, of that vision from, uh, from Tom. Um, and, and the central question that we're trying to ask ourselves as we're building the technology platform here at Ginkgo is, uh, what if we could program cells as easily as we program computers? Um, uh, the reason for this, uh, from our perspective, is that 
at the heart of biology is, is digital code in the form of DNA. Um, it may not look like the code that we write on computers. Uh, you know, it's not ones and zeros, it's A's, T's, C's, and G's. Um, and of course, it's a programming substrate that we didn't design, evolution provided it for us. Um, and I'm sure if we had, you know, uh, you know, two hours to debate this, we could talk about all the ways in which this metaphor doesn't work. Um, but I think fundamentally what we realize is that if you can write a lot of DNA uh, via synthesis, and if you can read a lot of DNA via sequencing, there's a lot you can do that starts to look a lot like a lot like programming. As we get better at doing this, um, uh, the work of engineering biology will become more and more predictable. And ultimately, our, our mission at Ginkgo is to make sure that we can make biology easier to engineer. And again, you know, I think probably not a controversial concept to uh, to this crowd, but I think certainly it's a, it's a new concept uh, elsewhere. Um, one of the things that that inspires us about uh, really driving to change the way people think about biology and engineering biology is um, looking uh, to, to previous industries and how they dealt with a new concept. Of IBM at the time, and, and uh, Watson had been giving a talk around uh, something totally new called, uh, called data processing. Um, this was in the early 1930s. Uh, the idea that you would uh, use electronics to process data uh, was a totally foreign concept at, at the time. Um, and, and I think, you know, one of the things that inspires us at, at Ginkgo is despite the challenge of engineering uh, biology and despite the, the fact that we are very far from easily programming biological systems, um, I, I really think that the kind of fundamental uh, truth of biology does support that it is programmable. And it's, you know, very similar to the early days of data processing where just the idea, particularly to a traditional biologists, which I was uh, originally trained as, um, the idea that you could simply program biology is, is as foreign as data processing was uh, in, in the 1930s. So uh, given that we know that engineering biology is hard and that programming cells is hard, um, what's the best way to do that today? Um, at Ginkgo, we've done our best to try and build that. Um, uh, so uh, this is a snapshot of uh, what our labs uh, used to look like. Um, one of the things that's happened uh, over the last few months is that we've actually uh, significantly reconfigured uh, a lot of our space to accommodate uh, the work that we're doing specifically for, for COVID-19. Uh, but you know, the, general, uh, the general theme remains, which is how can we build a facility that uh, provides as much automation and software uh, to the various processes you need to do to engineer biology such that uh, the folks who are uh, driving these projects forward are spending more of their time on design and data uh, analysis and less of their time uh, moving uh, pipettes around. So, you know, I did my, my PhD in synthetic biology about 10 years ago. Um, I, I uh, spent uh, most of that time uh, at the bench moving small amounts of liquid around to uh, build pieces of DNA. Uh, we were a very forward-thinking lab when it came to uh, uh, DNA synthesis back in those days. Uh, I designed and synthesized uh, six genes over the course of my entire PhD, which was a lot at the time. Uh, DNA cost about a dollar per base pair back in those days. Um, today at Ginkgo, uh, we're actually designing and synthesizing uh, thousands of genes every month, sometimes 10 to 20,000 uh, uh, genes in a month. Um, and that's really born on the basis of applying all the software and automation such that uh, we're spending more of our time working on DNA design and, and less of our time working on molecular cloning. Um, of course, to, to support all this growth, uh, uh, we've, had a lot of, uh, we've had a lot of support. Um, uh, Ginkgo is actually uh, the first uh, biotech company uh, in the Y Combinator accelerator in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, that was back in, in 2015. Um, and since then, uh, we've raised uh, uh, over $900 million in, in private investment to, to build out uh, the company as you see it. So uh, today, uh, I was trying to get exact numbers for you, Maxine. I think we're, we're just over 400 people today. Um, and we expanded to about 140,000 square feet in Boston with the majority of that space uh, looking a lot like this photo. Okay, so what, what does Ginkgo normally do? Um, Ginkgo is a platform company. So uh, when we think about uh, engineering biology, we're not uh, normally oriented towards uh, developing particular products. Um, what we'd like to do is partner across various industries to provide uh, biological solutions. Um, um, and as you can see from the variety of, of industries on, on this slide, uh, we really feel that uh, biology is a core fundamental manufacturing technology. Um, essentially, if you can make something in the physical world, uh, there's likely an application that can be driven by, uh, by biological engineering. Uh, you know, some of the, these things are quite obvious. Uh, of course, therapeutics and, and pharmaceutical development has been tied to biological engineering for a long time. 
Uh, things like plant-based food, uh, for example, are, are examples of new markets that are really have their basis in biology but are being driven uh, uh, more and more by uh, bioengineering. Um, and then there are things like cultured ingredients, uh, which is actually how Ginkgo got its start commercially, um, which is uh, working with uh, fragrance and perfume companies to identify complex biological molecules that are hard to manufacture um, and figuring out how to engineer uh, microbes like yeast uh, to produce them via brewing processes. Um, so again, you know, uh, biology is a very powerful engineering substrate, uh, which allows us to partner across, uh, across many different industries. We made a decision very early on at Ginkgo that rather than try to specialize in one of these verticals, um, we'd rather work with a wide range of customers across the uh, U.S. government to the private sector uh, to identify as many applications for, for biology as possible. And that's uh, led to, to a large uh, range of partnerships. Um, normally, I'd spend uh, most of my time talking about the, these projects. Um, uh, but just to give you a little bit of, a, of an idea of what we're working on, uh, for example, uh, Robertet is, is a uh, French uh, a fragrance uh, company uh, that we work with. Uh, with, with Bayer um, Agriculture, we formed a joint venture in the uh, agriculture space called Join Bio. Um, this is a company uh, that leverages Ginkgo's uh, engineering platform to design microbes uh, that fix nitrogen for, uh, for crop plants. So about 3% uh, of the world's um, greenhouse gas emissions come from producing nitrogen fertilizer via the Haber-Bosch process, which all the chemical engineers in the audience should be very familiar with. Uh, what JOIN is working on is they're working on engineering microbes that uh, naturally fix uh, uh, nitrogen from the atmosphere and provide that to, to plants. And uh, certain plants like soybeans uh, already do this. Uh, what, what JOIN is interested in is um, allowing this process to support um, uh, the replacement of nitrogen for other plants like corn, wheat, and rice. Uh, Motif, uh, as Maxine mentioned, is uh, our new uh, spin out in the um, plant-based food space. Uh, so if you're familiar with foods like the Impossible Burger, these are plant-based foods uh, that have uh, unique hero ingredients uh, like uh, the heme protein uh, that are produced via fermentation. Uh, so for Motif, we're, we're engineering uh, microbes to produce a range of, of interesting ingredients uh, for inclusion in, in plant-based foods. Um, and then uh, Synlogic, uh, which is just around the corner from the makerspace, is a, a company uh, that works on engineered microbes as, as therapeutics. So we have a, a very broad partnership with them, uh, where again, we're, we're helping them engineer E. coli to uh, address metabolic disorders and other, other diseases. Um, and then finally, uh, Kronos is a company based in Canada uh, that's one of the foremost producers of cannabis. Um, and, and one of the kind of next generation applications for, uh, for cannabis is uh, engineering yeast to produce those products uh, uh, more, both more cost effectively, uh, but also producing a wider uh, range of cannabinoids, including uh, cannabinoids that are difficult to uh, purify and manufacture, uh, but have uh, pharmaceutical properties. So, uh, you know, the way that we support uh, this diverse range of work at Ginkgo is that we have a very flexible uh, platform that basically provides automation and software to all the various uh, pieces uh, that you need to put together to engineer an organism. Uh, so, you know, you've probably heard this uh, talking about synthetic biology in a number of different forums now, but, you know, ultimately everyone has their own variation of design, build, test. Um, you know, for us within our foundries, these are groups uh, that are organized around accelerating and scaling uh, each of those processes. Um, I actually got my start at Ginkgo uh, first five years here, uh, building out our design group. Uh, so this is the computational group that designs new genes and proteins. Uh, a lot of that work, as you can imagine, is working on new algorithms to source interesting genetic content um, and then driving that via large scale DNA synthesis uh, to actually test those designs. Um, so again, uh, you know, I mentioned that we're synthesizing thousands of genes per month uh, that comes via two uh, major sources. Um, we acquired a Cambridge based uh, MIT related uh, a biotech company called Gen9, which manufactures uh, uh, DNA about two years ago. Um, so their DNA synthesis pipeline is integrated into our foundry. Uh, and then we also have a deal with Twist Biosciences over in California, uh, where they have a, a 1 billion base pair supply agreement with us to provide a synthetic DNA. So that re results in uh, many thousands of new genetic designs. And then we run those through our test pipeline, uh, which consists of high throughput next generation sequencing, as I'll talk a lot about uh, today, 
um, as well as high throughput uh, metabolomics, uh, proteomics, um, as well as making sure that we're actually uh, leveraging evolution as well. So a lot of the work that we do, um, in addition to kind of rational design of organisms, also depends on high throughput uh, screening and selection uh, based, on, based on directed evolution as well. Um, and then finally, and this is important to our work in manufacturing optimization, uh, we have a high throughput facility that specializes in automated fermentation uh, so that we have more than 100, uh, uh, we have more than 100 uh, fermenters that are uh, capable of being run simultaneously to work on process optimization. Um, so an important part of, uh, you know, Ginkgo's uh, business, particularly pre-COVID-19, is that we're not only responsible for designing a new microbe, we have to make sure that that microbe um, is compatible with a commercial uh, uh, process. So, um, you know, our job is not done uh, once we've done a high throughput screen. We have to show that that uh, new, uh, new design functions well um, in larger and larger fermenters such that we can hand those off for full scale manufacturing. So uh, everything I've talked about today basically describes uh, Ginkgo up until about March 15th, uh, 2020. Um, uh, uh, like, like many of the folks uh, here, uh, what we've done since then is very different than what we were doing uh, before that. Um, one of the things that we feel very, very strongly about at Ginkgo is that uh, you know, biology is a very powerful uh, technology. Um, and, and when something like COVID-19 happens, uh, as a flexible platform, we really owe it to ourselves to figure out um, what is every way possible we can use that platform to help. So uh, one of the things that we, that we did immediately was we decided to um, look at our capacity, um, effectively our capacity across the platform and say, how much of that can be rededicated to support um, uh, coronavirus efforts? Um, so you know, this is actually detailed in the article in the Wall Street Journal that's, that's shown here. Uh, so I won't uh, belabor it, but what we effectively did is we paused um, uh, most of our projects with the exception of a few key pharmaceutical projects um, um, and then decided to uh, use that freed up capacity to um, help out the rest of the COVID-19 response. Um, so in addition to providing platform capacity, we also said we'd be willing to spend uh, up to $25 million of our own funding. Um, as I noted earlier, we've been very fortunate in terms of fundraising. So we decided that we would set aside $25 million to partner uh, with companies and labs uh, across the COVID-19 response uh, to make sure that we're uh, leveraging our, our platform uh, to help out those groups as well. Uh, a few different things that, that we've uh, uh, done to date. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, that our foundry has a, a very large capacity for DNA synthesis. Uh, one of the first things that we did uh, as part of the COVID-19 response was to offer uh, free DNA synthesis uh, uh, to a number of groups. And we also realized that there are many very common constructs that were being used across the COVID-19 response. So uh, partnering with both AdGene and the Biobricks Foundation through their free genes program, uh, we went out and synthesized expression constructs for um, for all of the key open reading frames uh, that researchers need for COVID-19 um, in a variety of formats. Uh, so bacterial, uh, yeast expression, mammalian expression, uh, with a whole variety of, of affinity tags, uh, and then uh, submitted those to both AdGene and, and the Biobricks Foundation. Um, so uh, you're, you're welcome to, to browse on AdGene for, uh, for the hundreds of plasmas that we, we've added so far. Um, uh, this, was, this was an effort to make sure that we could uh, make these available as quickly uh, as possible, um, and they're free for re researchers to use uh, from either of these uh, repositories. Um, uh, another effort uh, was that we have a very large scale DNA sequencing uh, capacity. And I'll revisit this when I talk more about our work in diagnostics. But, you know, an interesting thing about Ginkgo is that given that we're engineering so many microbes uh, under normal circumstances, uh, we have a very sophisticated next generation sequencing pipeline that's actually oriented towards sequencing very short genomes. So, you know, most, uh, most people who use next generation sequencing are sequencing uh, very large genomes like plant genomes or human genomes. Uh, our scale is, is such that at Ginkgo that we actually sequence, uh, use a NovaSeq sequencer uh, for sequencing plasmids. Um, so of course, anyone who knows uh, about next generation sequencing uh, knows that that's a crazy amount of sequencing capacity to apply it towards plasmids. Uh, the way that we use that uh, effectively is that we're actually sequencing thousands of plasmids in any single run. Um, so because of that, uh, we've developed a lot of the techniques to be able to uh, multiplex a very, very large number of barcodes and be able to demultiplex that data so that we can uh, sequence many thousands of short, uh, short plasmids uh, on a routine basis. 
And perhaps more importantly, uh, we also have the uh, automation front end for all of that, such that uh, it was routine pre-COVID-19 for us to sequence uh, 2,000 to 3,000 plasmids every single day. So one of the first things that we did uh, early on in the COVID-19 response was say, uh, how can we use the sequencing capacity to sequence the SARS-CoV-2 genome? Uh, that's a 29 KB genome, uh, not much bigger than the plasmas we routinely sequence. Um, and we know that uh, having as many sequences available as possible can really help in the epidemiological response uh, to COVID-19. So we, we partnered with a number of diagnostics labs, particularly early in the pandemic, March and April, uh, to sequence um, a subset of their positive samples that they were receiving for RT-PCR testing. Um, uh, around 1,500 of those genome sequences so far um, um, have, been, have been completed um, and are in the process of being uh, submitted to databases such as uh, NextTrain, as you see here on this, on this slide. Uh, basically, if you search uh, NextTrain for submitting lab as a Ginkgo Bioworks Clinical Laboratory, uh, you'll find the sequences that we, that we deposited there. Um, and this is something that we're continuing on in the background, particularly as part of the CDC SPHERES Consortium, which is a epidemiological consortium uh, around next generation sequencing set up by the CDC uh, to make sure that we can continue to contribute uh, important genome sequences uh, to this effort. Uh, we also are doing work in, in therapeutics and vaccines. Um, on the therapeutics front, uh, perhaps one of the uh, most important uh, class of therapeutics in active development today are antibody therapeutics. Um, we're very fortunate to have a collaboration uh, with Berkeley Lights and a very large partnership with Berkeley Lights prior to uh, COVID-19, which are now leveraging uh, for this work. Uh, so for the chemical and biological engineers in the audience, uh, if you're not familiar with the Berkeley Lights technology, you definitely should be. Um, it's a really cool uh, way of essentially doing microfluidics on, on steroids. Uh, you can sort individual cells uh, uh, with a microfluidic platform. Uh, you can literally you know, click on cells and move them around. Um, uh, and it's really well suited to high throughput uh, antibody optimization. Uh, so we're part of a consortium with Berkeley Lights uh, to partner with uh, an, uh, antibody therapeutic companies to make sure we're using that platform uh, to help them improve their, their therapeutics. Um, in addition to that, we're working with a number of, of companies around uh, different uh, aspects of, of the therapeutics response, um, um, including uh, also doing high throughput screening of, of antibodies uh, to find better binders uh, for, uh, for diagnostics as well as for therapeutics. Um, and then finally, in the vaccine space, uh, I can't go into too much detail about the, the work that we're doing here, uh, uh, but the, the one uh, partnership that we've announced here is that um, uh, back in April, uh, we partnered with Moderna uh, to help them with the uh, manufacturing of, of their uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Um, as you can imagine, uh, the manufacturing process for a uh, novel uh, vaccine modality like, uh, like mRNA um, um, is something that uh, uh, can always benefit from, uh, from optimization. And if you think about the way that these uh, uh, DNA and RNA vaccines are manufactured, a lot of the process for, these, for their manufacturing looks a lot like the industrial uh, microbiology processes that, that Ginkgo works on routinely. So, you know, a lot of the, the kind of raw materials here are manufactured in E. coli, for example. Uh, so we partnered with, with Moderna uh, to help them optimize the manufacturing process for a number of the raw materials for their uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Um, so I'd like to spend the, the rest of my talk talking about the work that we're doing in very large scale diagnostics. Um, I don't think I need to really belabor the point uh, that the US needs uh, millions of tests per day. Um, certainly given the current state of the pandemic, uh, it's very clear that even just for diagnostic testing, we don't have enough tests. Uh, uh, I was just looking at the numbers today. The state of Texas has a test positivity rate of 20%, um, when ideally you'd like to have that below 5%. Um, so certainly, uh, just from a sheer numbers perspective, we don't have, have enough tests. Um, so, you know, Ginkgo has uh, spent a lot of our capacity over the last few months really focusing on the problem of how can we leverage next generation sequencing uh, to massively uh, scale the amount of diagnostic tests that are available for the United States. Uh, we, we've done this uh, by also launching a brand called Concentric. Uh, Concentric is the end-to-end -end, uh, brand that offers diagnostics to end, end customers, as I'll explain in a bit. But the core technology of this is leveraging uh, machines such as the Illumina NovaSeq uh, to enable high-throughput testing. Uh, you know, a quick uh, set of definitions. 
So, you know, what I've been mentioning so far is that there's a shortage of clinical diagnostics. Um, there's also a second class of tests that we feel is going to be extremely important in terms of uh, reopening the economy, allowing people to return to work and school. Um, and that's what, what we call asymptomatic uh, suppression testing. Um, so, so that means, uh, you know, you're not getting a test when you suspect you may have been exposed to COVID-19. That means your entire workplace or your entire school is getting testing uh, weekly or, or multiple times per week, uh, just as a surveillance method to identify outbreaks early. And we feel like Currently, the supply of tests is so constrained that we're not able to supply them for clinical diagnostics. But if you truly had uh, millions or tens of millions of tests per day available, then we could return to work prior to a vaccine uh, safely by being able to provide very large scale suppression testing as well. So that's another reason, even if we catch up on diagnostic tests for the current uh, crisis, suppression testing is really our way forward. Okay, so why, why next generation sequencing? I'm happy to talk about this more in the in the Q and A. Uh, you know, for us, we really want to support as many technologies as are needed to solve this problem. So we actually put together a white paper that's available on our website um, that compares a lot of the different technologies that are being developed. You'll hear a lot more about uh, CRISPR from from Sherlock Biosciences later in the seminar series. Um, ultimately, each of these tests has their own advantages and disadvantages, and we need an all of the above approach to make sure that we can uh, solve this problem. For NGS, NGS from our perspective is all about scale at low cost. Uh, so a single NovaSeq uh, with the appropriate barcodes can handle 50,000 samples per run, uh, which, which means that effectively you're replacing uh, hundreds of, of uh, qPCR machines with a single NovaSeq. Um, you can use uh, simpler uh, uh, amplification methods such as uh, traditional PCR to provide the input samples for that. Um, obviously, this works well if you can mass, uh, massively scale and centralize your samples into a single facility. Uh, so our model for NGS is that you build a large centralized facility with a small number of NovaSeqs uh, with an acceptable turnaround time of 24 to 48 hours, which is on par uh, with best case scenario for current diagnostics um, and handle that, uh, uh, handle that uh, by uh, combining many tests into, into a single facility. Um, in terms of methods development, uh, our focus has been on saliva. Um, again, if you think about uh, suppression testing, um, you know, it, it's, it's hard to imagine wanting a, a return to work strategy where you need to do use uh, uh, an oral pharyngeal or nasopharyngeal swab uh, every day. Uh, you know, the, the Broad has been working on, uh, on simpler nasal sampling um, and saliva is another way to have a simple collection modality that you can imagine having people do uh, multiple times per, per week. Um, so we're collaborating with a, a number of groups. Uh, so Illumina, uh, uh, of course, has been a partner of ours for a long time as we're a, a very um, a big customer of them given our sequencing demand. Uh, they also invested in Ginkgo as part of our COVID-19 response. So we raised a, a $70 million round uh, supported by Illumina uh, to really um, um, expand our efforts in this area. Um, and then we're also par partnering with Octant Bio over in California. Uh, they're, they were uh, leading a consortium of groups adapting an open source product protocol called SwabSeq, um, which is basically a, a method for uh, using NGS machines for, um, uh, for diagnostics that they've made available under the open COVID license. So a number of academic groups and, and companies are collaborating under this, this consortium uh, to find different ways to develop NGS based uh, tests with this technique. Um, so, you know, from the Ginkgo perspective, um, our initial EUA submission um, is for clinical diagnostics. Um, but again, we're, we're building out the data sets and, and the discussions with the FDA to support asymptomatic screening and, and ultimately eventually pooled testing, uh, which would give us another uh, significant multiplier in terms of, in terms of capacity. Um, example on, on the right is some of our uh, data generated to date. Uh, you can see that uh, NGS um, detection uh, is, quite, is quite sensitive uh, and, and comparable to, uh, to PCR. You can get a dose uh, specific response. And again, you can do this for tens of thousands, as many as 50,000 samples uh, per, per run. So uh, what have we been doing at Ginkgo for the last uh, few months? Um, ultimately, the, the whole game here is that, uh, you know, it's great that you can get 50,000 samples into a single sequencer. Uh, the tougher question is, how do you get all those samples into the sequencer in the first place? Um, so the reason that we have a lot of confidence, uh, you know, uh, in, this, in this approach is that uh, this is really what Ginkgo does day to day, which is build complex automation to keep uh, instruments busy. Um, you know, our current facility is, is not sufficient for this. Uh, so we've actually been spending a lot of the last couple of months reconfiguring our entire facility as well as building a new foundry uh, to support our, our diagnostics effort. Uh, so uh, what are the things that we've had to put in place? 
uh, specifically for the COVID-19 response. Um, Biosafety level two coverage, uh, that was something that we only had in our mammalian space uh, prior to COVID-19. Uh, we essentially qualified all of our laboratory space with a few small uh, exceptions to be BSL-2. Uh, we did a big uh, sprint uh, to get our lab CLIA certified. So this is the clinical certification you need to be able to perform diagnostic tests. Uh, we were able to do that in, in two months, which is a extremely uh, a fast uh, a timeline. Um, um, and then we've also been working with both the NIH and, and the FDA. So we, we submitted um, our EUA, uh, our initial EUA uh, application last, last month. Um, and then as Maxine noted, we're also uh, selected as part of the NIH uh, shark tank called RADx for uh, new COVID-19 diagnostics applications. Um, this is where they, they uh, 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 saw pitches from more than 100 different uh, institutions and selected seven uh, uh, labs and companies uh, to proceed to the next phase. Uh, so we were able to uh, secure $40 million from the NIH uh, to support uh, more scaling of this, uh, of this testing facility. Um, so what are we doing via concentric? So we realize that it's not really enough to uh, simply set up the uh, testing capacity. Uh, you need to, uh, a way to actually get those diagnostic tests to where, where they're needed. Um, so concentric is a, is a commercial brand um, that we're building out that provides end-to-end -end testing support. So uh, if, you're, uh, if you're an organization uh, that would like to work with concentric, uh, to either get diagnostic or, or suppression testing. Uh, you can sign up on our, on our website and our sales folks will basically handle um, uh, all the work needed to figure out, okay, what is the testing plan that makes sense for your organization? Uh, what is the frequency of, of, of testing needed, et cetera? Um, as I mentioned, we, we submitted our EUA last month, but we're actually offering uh, testing today. Um, the reason we're able to do that uh, is that we've also partnered uh, with a, a company at Rutgers, um, Infinite Biologics, um, uh, that has an EUA test for, for saliva. This is an RT qPCR based test, um, um, but it has the same upfront uh, collection modality that we'll be using uh, moving, moving forward. So by partnering with them, we're able to get into the market early, um, help them provide uh, more, uh, more demand for, for their tests to make sure that their capacity can be, can be optimized. Um, um, and then of course, as the NGS test uh, uh, gains uh, uh, an emergency use authorization, we can uh, significantly expand the capacity available for that, uh, for that sort of saliva-based testing. And again, the, the RADx program uh, is extremely ambitious. It's extremely ambitious because of the need for millions of tests per day across the country. Uh, so working with the NIH, our aim is to have hundreds of thousands of tests per day from our Boston-based facility by Q4 of this year. Um, before I wrap up here, I, I wanted to, to make a note on the work we've been doing in biosecurity. And this is actually something that I've been uh, working on with a number of folks at Ginkgo um, you know, prior to COVID-19, which is ultimately, if you think about uh, building a platform for engineering biology and making that easier to engineer, uh, you also want to make sure that you're building a secure platform. So the analogy that, that Tom always shares with us is that, you know, if you had a time machine and you could go back to the 1960s and 1970s, uh, you'd probably show up at MIT uh, and work with the early computer scientists and electrical engineers to get a head start on, on cybersecurity. We think about biology as a platform that's ultimately uh, likely to be more powerful than computing, so we, we better really invest in biosecurity early um, with the added uh, uh, issue that, you know, of course, we're all made of biology, so, uh, so we have an even more vested interest in making sure that engineering biology is something that's done responsibly. Uh, a few different ways that we've been approaching this prior to COVID-19. Uh, one is by, you know, working with uh, uh, the private sector and, and academia to develop better frameworks for understanding uh, engineered biology. This is a, a report uh, that I contributed to for the National Academy of Sciences um, around how to think about uh, bio, biodefense. Um, uh, one of the you know, things that's raised both in, in this report as well as many others is that, of course, uh, you know, engineered biological systems are, are a threat that we should be concerned about. Um, uh, but the, the biggest threat, you know, even, even two, two or three years ago, has always been the looming threat of a potential, uh, potential pandemic. Um, and of course, uh, today we're, we're living that. Um, so, so I think uh, you know, part of the responsibility for platforms like Ginkgo's is that um, you know, we're getting involved in the COVID-19 response because we feel like it's a big part of the solution to uh, defending ourselves from, from pandemics in the future. And the better we can build out the, these platforms and the more responsive we can be, uh, the less of a threat uh, both pandemics and, and potentially engineered uh, threats become. Um, other work that we're doing in this, in this space 
uh, has been partnering with the US government around uh, detecting um, uh, potential engineered sequences. Um, so we're part of a, a program with IARPA, the Intelligence Advanced Research Pro uh, Projects Agency in the government uh, to develop deep learning models to identify the difference between engineered and non-engineered biological sequences. Um, uh, for the US government, this is a detection method that helps us determine whether a, a virus uh, is engineered. This is actually something that they put into place for COVID-19. So they asked all the teams uh, participating in this, in this effort to analyze the SARS-CoV-2 genome. Uh, it does not appear to be engineered, but of course there was uh, you know, a lot of concern around that. And then you know, on, the, on the bright side for Ginkgo, uh, developing and investing in these uh, deep learning algorithms for recognizing engineered DNA sequences also help us build much more sophisticated uh, design tools. So one of the things I always worry about as an engineer is am I unconsciously uh, placing uh, biases in my DNA designs uh, that negatively impact their performance? Um, so developing these types of advanced machine learning and deep learning models help us both address a security issue uh, while also helping us uh, design better DNA in the first place. Um, so ultimately, I think, you know, both with Concentric and our, our, our efforts at Ginkgo, I think it really is important for all bioengineers to, to think about and realize that, you know, biosecurity is, is related to health security um, and seeing, uh, you know, how much um, uh, destruction that, that COVID-19 has really uh, brought to the community so far. Um, I think as, as bioengineers, probably the one of the most important contributions we can do moving forward is figuring out how do we make biology and specifically engineered biology part of the solution. So, you know, uh, what we'd love to do is to make sure that platforms like Ginkgo's um, and, and uh, acad academic institutions like MIT can partner uh, to respond more quickly to, to the next uh, uh, pandemic threat. Um, obviously, the world we'd all like to live in is, is where pandemics like COVID-19 never have a chance to really uh, uh, take hold and, and grow. Um, and of course, uh, bioengineering and, and making the response to uh, to these threats faster is something that we can we can all contribute that will hopefully make the make the world a bit safer. Um, so I'll end there. Uh, uh, hopefully we have uh, some time to answer answer questions. Uh, but yeah, thanks for thanks for listening and, and happy to uh, answer any questions you have about about what we're doing at Ginkgo. Excellent, thank you, Patrick. Um, quite a quite a range of of um, applications. So it's really awesome to see all that. So we have uh, about 17 minutes on time. So plenty, plenty of time for questions. As I mentioned to folks at the beginning, uh, if you can uh, use the raise hand icon, I'll bring you off mute. You can ask your question directly and uh, we can have the an exchange interaction that way. Um, Quick, quick, uh, easy question uh, that I can answer. <laughs> um, uh, so, so what what does head of head of code base mean? So, uh, yeah, so you know, it's a, a intentionally obtuse title. Um, uh, you know, I mentioned at the beginning uh, that uh, Ginkgo likes to think about engineering biology the way you would program uh, anything else. So, uh, what what does a programmer for biology need to work on? Uh, not only do you need a sophisticated uh, facility to do that engineering, that's what we call our, our foundries, um, but you also need to build out a programming discipline for, for engineering biological systems. So if you're a software developer, uh, basically a code base is the, the set of uh, code libraries that you routinely use to um, design complex programs. So if you're a programmer at Google, um, you don't start writing a new application from scratch. You say, what, what is a new application I can build from the existing Google code base that allows me to build a, a sophisticated functional app as, as quickly as I can? Um, if you think about engineering biology as, as programming, uh, then our code base is um, sophisticated chassis strains that, that produce uh, particular um, uh, precursors for metabolic pathways. Um, it's uh, DNA design uh, approaches and algorithms. Uh, it's useful enzymes that we, we've collected. Uh, so what I'm uh, responsible for at, at Ginkgo is that I oversee essentially our programmers, our biological programmers. Um, uh, and, and part of my mandate is ensuring that uh, they're building an ever more sophisticated code base such that as we sign on a new project, we're able to start from step three or step four and not, not step one. Um, you know, an example for this is that some of the manufacturing work that we're doing for the COVID-19 response uh, is, is heavily based on work that we're doing prior to COVID-19 around optimizing microbial manufacturing systems, for example. A lot of that know-how um, and even, uh, even the strains and approaches that we're using uh, were on the basis of, of projects that we've done before. Uh, Maxine, would you like to uh, to add anything? You have a hand up. 
I have a quick question, Patrick. You mentioned that Concentric was an end-to-end -end service that Vinco provided. And I was wondering what that means in terms of sample collections for your diagnostics and in, how do you do this? And also in terms of turnaround times, how quickly would people get an answer and what format this answer would be in? Right. Right. Yeah. So um, uh, think about this from the from the engineer's perspective, right, to, to like run a centralized facility that's doing tens or hundreds of thousands of tests per day. Um, you really want those tests to come into Ginkgo uh, as, in large batches, if at all possible. Uh, the reason for this being that the, the more time you can spend running samples through instruments and the less time you're spending re-racking tubes or unpacking boxes, the more effective your facility can be. Um, uh, fortunately, this is this is well aligned with the uh, suppression testing model for schools and workplaces. Um, so the idea is is basically that um, uh, we partner with with organizations that have a large scale demand for testing. Uh, we provide them all the materials they need to uh, to run those tests, including uh, racks and racks and racks of, of sample tubes. Um, uh, those all get collected at a centralized place. So what comes back to Ginkgo are, um, you know, hundreds or, or thousands of samples uh, on that are already on racks um, uh, that can be accessioned and, and moved into the into the facility. Um, ultimately, what, what we'd like to do to achieve um, the maximum scale possible um, is to do the sample collection um, in tubes that are as, as close to the initial input to the uh, automated facility as possible. So, um, you know, you'll basically receive a, a barcoded tube with a collection device. Um, and what we get back at Ginkgo is just racks of these tubes that are ready to go straight into, into the robots. But, you know, it's, it's about kind of aligning what we think is best for what the community needs in terms of uh, reopening strategies um, um, and trying to align that with uh, the logistical challenge of, of how do you handle so many samples in, in one place. So, you know, luckily for us, uh, those two things are aligned. Thank you. As we wait for more questions from the audience, um, Ginkgo is based in Boston, as you were saying. Uh, any, well, first of all, is that enough to, to reach your goals of a hundred, a few hundred thousand samples per day to be reached uh, at the end of the year? Um, are there plans to have several Ginkgos throughout the country? Uh, I mean, that, that would be pretty cool, right? Um, I think, you know, our, our focus to date uh, and, and the focus on scale is we actually feel that we can do hundreds of thousands of tests per day in a single facility ba based in Boston. Um, you know, that, that's one of the cool things about the, these NovaSeq instruments is that if you can get 50,000 samples onto a single NovaSeq, uh, you can actually uh, operate a pretty um, a large scale facility with a small number of sequencing instruments. Um, that being said, given that we're running this uh, centralized model, Obviously, all the samples need to be shipped to us uh, so they can process them. Um, so there are ongoing discussions about what, what do kind of regional centers look like that help uh, you know, reduce turnaround time across the, the country. And this is really you know, one of the reasons why we're really emphasizing kind of an all of the above approach when it comes to uh, technology is that uh, the need for testing is, is so high um, and the need for different types of testing is, is so high that we really feel like different organizations, different regions are, are going to have much different testing demands. Um, and, you know, there are kind of two, um, uh, two challenges that the NIH is trying to address here. One, which is just volume, um, uh, which we're certainly working on. Uh, and then the other, which is, which is uh, low cost and, and, and variety. So you can certainly imagine a future in which, uh, you know, a very rapid, um, uh, rapid uh, point of care test is used to kind of quickly screen people uh, that might need uh, more sophisticated diagnostic testing um, and kind of supplementing uh, multiple different te uh, testing technologies together. Um, ultimately, to make these, uh, uh, you know, these are all uh, challenging problems. And I think if we uh, answer the capacity question, uh, then, then uh, state and local governments have a lot more options for how they can respond to uh, needs. And as we know, like the, the need for diagnostics is constantly changing, particularly with uh, back to school and attempt to reopen the economy. Uh, the variety of tests needed is also changing over time. So yeah, you get a lot of flexibility if you have the capacity. Right now as a country, we don't have enough capacity or flexibility. Thanks. What, what would you estimate is the um, target price point that is needed for the asymptomatic testing? 
Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think, um, you know, a lot of this depends on on what the US government decides to, to do in this space. I think, you know, it's important to remember that we're losing billions of dollars per day um, um, in lost productivity, uh, never mind the, the lost productivity in the form of, of, you know, kids not going to school, um, you know, uh, people be, being out of, out of work. It's both a, a health and, and economic crisis. Um, so I think for, from that perspective, um, you know, there's a lot of reasons to uh, want to spend a lot of money to solve this problem just because the ability to kind of reopen the economy safely and a lot of people go back to school is worth billions and billions of dollars per, per day. So, you know, I think part of the question is, is how much is society willing to spend um, uh, to be able to, to return to some semblance of normal? Um, but ultimately, uh, in terms of like cost per test, uh, that's that's one of the reasons why we're excited about um, pooling technology. So, you know, obviously saliva is a modality that loans, uh, uh, lends itself well to, to pooling. Um, uh, basically, if you have a very uh, a low um, uh, community incidence rate, you can do very high pooling ratios, which would mean that, um, uh, you know, if you have a facility doing 100,000 tests per day, and you can pool at a 10 to 1 ratio, then you can do a million tests per day without investing a lot of extra hardware. Um, so we think as, as, as things develop, um, hopefully pool testing will help get the cost down to, you know, dollars, uh, like, you know, single digit dollars per, per test or even less. Uh, and we have a question from Jacob. So you should be able to speak, Jacob. Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So I know you were talking a little bit before about the code base at Ginkgo and that you guys are building. And I was wondering what percentage of that is existing genetic code that's already out there in the world, um, as opposed to new genetic code that you're writing, um, creating novel genes. And how do you see that percentage changing with time as well? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And, and certainly early on, um, one of the reasons why we invested so heavily in DNA sequencing and synthesis is that you know, nature's had four, four plus billion years to design really cool things. Um, so we've gotten a lot of utility simply by scaling up the uh, number of gene, new gene content uh, that we can look at every every day for our projects. Um, so certainly in the beginning, 100% of, of the code base we were developing was based on screening these naturally occurring genes. And I, I do think this is going to be a real driving force moving forward for uh, building ever more sophisticated biological systems is we've only scratched the surface of what's out there. Uh, that being said, as we've gotten better at screening, particularly enzymes, um, uh, our, our design approach and engineering teams have put a lot of work into uh, predictive algorithms, uh, particularly around protein uh, structure prediction and engineering. Uh, such that, you know, we're often looking for new, new gene content by sourcing them from natural systems, but we're also computationally um, overlaying mutations or structural changes or even chimeras of these of these proteins as we synthesize them uh, in an attempt to further further optimize them. So many of our, you know, proteins and enzymes in our projects end up uh, coming from a natural source to begin with, but are highly, highly engineered by the time we're done. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Etty. Um, hi, so uh, you mentioned uh, as a platform company, you're across several different markets like agriculture, food. Um, how has that, how has expertise in, or in those different industries helped with the, with the projects with, like, for the pandemic and all the testing? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's really one of the reasons why I love biology is that, um, you know, a lot of the core technology, uh, bio, well, biology as a substrate doesn't care about, you know, markets, right? <laughs> um, um, and, and if you think about how that could be applied to the COVID-19 response, you know, think about engineering a uh, microbial or mammalian cell to produce a protein. Um, you know, uh, so a therapeutic protein or an antibody um, ultimately comes down to a manufacturing and expression optimization problem it's the exact same problem to solve for a company like Motif, where we're engineering a microbial system uh, to produce a nutritional protein. Um, uh, other, other examples of that are, you know, uh, some of the pathways you use to produce high-end fragrances um, have a lot of overlap with the same pathways you might use to, uh, to engineer uh, or produce fuels or materials. Um, and that, you know, is kind of a byproduct of evolution. Um, you know, nature is very powerful, uh, but also fundamentally lazy, right? So a lot of the same biochemical pathways um, have been repurposed many, many times for a wide variety of, of chemistry. So, you know, from that perspective, uh, what we like about it is that um, we can build out uh, expertise in biological engineering and, and see how the exact same underlying bio biological technology can serve many different uh, vertical markets that way. Uh, 
All right, I, we have a question from Sophie. Sophie, you should be able to uh, unmute your microphone and ask. Hi, um, with the suppression testing techniques, um, what you mentioned was that you can be able to test like a large group of people, but is this testing method recognized by like the traditional, com as compared to traditional testing methods, which are counted by the government and are counted into state numbers? Right, so, uh, so to date, um, our EUA and, and the work that we're doing with Rutgers is for clinical diagnostics. So those are uh, those uh, basically fitting under the traditional emergency use authorization that the FDA has in place. So that's you know, either a, a, a workplace or a doctor orders a particular test for somebody who's suspected of having COVID-19 and you get a result back. And those are the, the types of tests that are typically counted in those numbers. Um, the FDA uh, kind of recognizing the, the challenges in, in containing this pandemic um, has some new classes of diagnostics that they're um, uh, allowing for EOA submission now. So uh, that's for testing asymptomatic people. Um, so most of the screening that's been done to date on asymptomatic people has been under a specific physician order that says you can use a test that is not intended for asymptomatics for asymptomatics. The FDA now has a new category that allows you to submit specifically for asymptomatic screening testing. Um, and then they, they've also allowed uh, people to submit EUAs for pooled testing, uh, which again is recognition for the need for more capacity. So in fact, the first uh, pooled asymptomatic test uh, um, has, been, um, has been submitted and approved um, to the FDA and there are many others behind it. So I think as these new types of tests come online, um, I'm hoping that they'll break out the numbers so we can compare apples to apples. Um, uh, but most of the numbers that are being uh, reported to date are, are clinical diagnostic testing. All right. I have a question from Ira. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing. Uh, you should be able to unmute. Um, all right. Not coming off of mute, so we all just ask this one from the chat. Uh, is there any effort to develop tests from uh, sweat of a patient or only saliva? Um, right now, the efforts uh, at Ginkgo are focused on, on saliva. Um, the swab seat consortium is, is more broad. Uh, I'd say, you know, most, most groups are focusing on either saliva or, or the simplest possible nasal swabs um, that you can do, again, for purposes of, of scale and, and convenience. Um, Sweat is pretty interesting. Um, um, I haven't seen groups specifically working on that. Um, there are, of course, a, a large number of groups uh, working on uh, blood tests, serological tests. And in fact, we have a couple of projects internally at Ginkgo partnering with companies around developing better tests in that space. And those are blood tests that would test for the presence of antibodies um, or antigens for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I've got a question here from Nigel. I should be able to speak. Nigel's from uh, JGI. Hi, Nigel. How's it going? Yeah, good. Thanks, Patrick. Hey, awesome uh, presentation and just fantastic that you guys are, uh, you know, pivoted towards the COVID work. Um, question is, you know, are you also considering uh, to use your automation to conduct antigen and or antibody tests beyond the nucleic acid testing? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so one of the early projects that we we booted up is is we're partnering with a number of groups, and uh, you know, happy to chat more about this offline uh, around developing better antigens for serological tests. So, we've been expressing, for example, full length spike protein in mammalian cells and, and finding ways to improve uh, expression of that of that protein to make uh, cheaper, more accessible um, uh, serological tests uh, and more accurate ones, hopefully. Um, and then on the antigen uh, uh, diagnostics, we're, yeah, we're also working on, on uh, antibodies and um, hopefully lateral flow assays um, um, that would enable like super cheap um, um, antigen-based uh, based diagnostics. You know, of course, uh, you know, there are drawbacks uh, to, those, uh, to those diagnostics as well. But, you know, in terms of going back to that all of the above approach, if you have kind of a, a super, super cheap rapid test that at least tells you, hey, you, you better get a, a diagnostic test. Um, that could go a long way towards this kind of suppression testing uh, concept. So yeah, uh, absolutely happy to follow up uh, offline uh, in more detail about that, but we have efforts in, in both spaces. Great, thanks. Great, I think um, Melody has a question. Um, I think I asked it in the chat, sorry, I might have accidentally pressed my hand as well, but. Um, what are your concerns when it comes to like testing turnaround time? Because I know that's been a very big concern and how fast do you think people will be able to get their results? 
Yeah, uh, th this is something that that uh, you know everyone is is concerned about. And in fact, uh, you know, internally we've engaged uh, a number of epidemiological modeling uh, folks to to make sure that we're developing strategies that are compatible with uh, particularly workplace screening. Um, and, and as you probably know, like you know, most of these models indicate that you want to test the workplace ideally once a week or or twice a week, even if you can get away with it. Um, uh, so of course, if you want to test your entire workplace once or twice a week. Um, and your turnaround time is more than a week, uh, it's not a very useful test, right? So, uh, so we're trying to keep turnaround times as close to 24 hours as possible. Um, I think, you know, the using next generation sequencing technology, uh, you know, it's a bit slower than, than PCR, but not that much slower. Uh, and in fact, most of the turnaround time is logistical. It's how do you get the samples to the facility? How do you get the tubes uh, processed and, and put through the sequencer? Um, but again, um, uh, everything that we've done so far indicates that, you know, 24 to 48 hours is possible. I, I think one of the things that you're seeing with returns uh, with respect to turnaround times increasing is that, you know, effectively, we're, we have more demand nationally for testing than we have supply. Uh, so, so a lot of the large scale organizations that are doing testing now are, are simply um, being dealing with more samples than they're set up to handle. So we feel like as capacity comes online, the turnaround times should uh, should drop. But fundamentally, it's just because we have much more demand than supply in testing right now. But fundamentally, there's no reason why any of these methods can't be 48 hours or ideally 24 hours or less. Thank you. Great. Well, we are up at the uh, end of the hour. It went by very quickly. So. Uh, there are also no more questions that look like they're currently out. So I think this is a good opportunity to, to draw to a close. So uh, I just want to say on behalf of the entire audience, thank you, Patrick, for telling us about all the work that you guys are doing. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And like I said, uh, looking forward to visiting the biomaker space someday. <laughs> Absolutely. We, uh, we look forward to getting opened back up again and, uh, and tackling some interesting projects ourselves. So Awesome. Cool. That's great. All right. And uh, thank you all to participants for attending today and we look forward to seeing you in uh, two weeks uh, for the uh, the talk from uh, Sherlock Biosciences. Cool. Have a excellent afternoon. Take care.